Me be done on. Me be done. This time, 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 this
possibles, all the slash grades, all of that. We've got a 200 boulder list. That's the kind of extreme nerdery, is that a word, that that Eric loves to, to dig into. So in this episode, we're talking about what makes a boulder a potential candidate for these lists, the best lists. We're also joined by longtime super climbing nerd and technician Max Zolotukin. I did not know Max was going to be here for this interview, but I'm glad I put a microphone in front of his face because I knew he was going to have something to say in this, and I'm glad he did. All right, let's get into it. Maybe don't, maybe don't. I definitely have friends who only want to climb five-star boulders, and therefore they're just not having fun most of the time because there's not that many five-star boulders. And if you lower your standard, you're going to get stronger, you're going to experience more climbing, so you're going to have a good time. Power. Power. This time to build. No doubt this morning in the rock shop pretty quickly, but it's just nice to get out of the city, breathe yep. fresh air. Yeah. But you got to touch some good blocks while you're out there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. A new project. So. Do you think, I'm just going to ask this question right off the bat. Do you think your new project would make your list? Oh, no, not quite. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. It's, <clears throat> it's really good. It's really good in a lot of ways, but I don't think it's quite got the right elements editor's note now that he's done the project he's changed his mind i think a lot of us would do that okay let's talk about what those well first let's talk about what the list is yeah you and i started chatting a while ago because you were on instagram talking about what the best boulders are of certain grades and of all grades um so what are the lists in their current state yeah, so I've pretty much always been obsessed with list making Yeah, ever since I learned what climbing was and that there were climbs that you could categorize into lists. And uh, really, I started making the list because when I would go to fall asleep at night, I couldn't because I just had all these boulder problems fluttering around in my head, all these things I wanted to do <laughs> and climb and experience, and I couldn't sleep, and it was a real problem. And I found that if I wrote these things down, then it sort of... Uh, compartmentalized it and then I could get some peace of mind. Yeah. But uh pretty much whenever I have a little too much time on my hands, like when I started the official top 100 list or whatever, I had I think it was a back injury, I don't know. I'm injured a lot, but it was some injury where I couldn't climb for a while and that magnified my longing to experience all these great <laughs> rock climbs in the world. And I really couldn't sleep for many nights. And so I, I was like, that's it. I'm writing them all down. And I wanted to engage the community and get a consensus because I wanted to be as objective as possible. And that would sort of serve as like my lifetime tick list. Like if I can do the majority of these boulders, I'll feel complete in life, you know? <laughs> yeah. So started writing down. Top 100, I, I have two lists. I have a single digit and double digit just because it's easier to divide it up. There's so many more single digit boulders than there are double digit boulders. Yeah. And uh, it's been good. Yeah. You said you tried to come to a consensus or get a consensus. Is that even possible? It's definitely like, not possible. Okay. No, not at all. But Everybody you can try. seems to have their own opinions on what makes a good boulder. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of bias involved in it too. You know, like I have, yep. I had people in my DMs who would only recommend like their first ascents or, yeah. you know, everyone has a climb that speaks to them on some other level, like that, a really personal experience with it or whatever. And do you think personal experience plays into at all, whether you should call it a good boulder or not? I think it plays into your subjective right. ranking. Like if you have your own personal list, these are the best <clears throat> boulders I've ever done or the boulders I want to do most yep. then for sure. And that's what my top 100 list originally was that I made when I was like 13. It was just like cool stuff I saw on Instagram that I <laughs> like knew I had to do. Yeah, totally. But when I looked back at that list, you know, six months ago or whatever, I realized that my opinions on bouldering had changed a lot after having moved across the country and been climbing internationally and experienced a lot more rock and problems. So it needed some revision, but, uh, 
for mm. an objective list, no, it does not. It cannot play a role. Yeah, I agree. And it kind of is frustrating when I see, like there have been websites or guidebook authors who try to take a, a star consensus um, to, to give a quality rating to a, any a, a sport route or a boulder. And inevitably there are people who are just like, choss wranglers or whatever and they love climbing whatever piece of choss there is and they had the greatest experience on it because they were alone in the woods or whatever and to them it's a five-star boulder right and in reality it's a zero star piece of choss if you look at it more objectively so i think those those lists that are created from consensus are oftentimes totally misleading yeah they can be i think i think that uh when looking at a guidebook mm. the guidebooks that i like and respect the most are the ones that acknowledge that a one-star boulder can be the most fun you'll ever have in your life it might yeah. be your favorite boulder of all time totally but they try and keep that objective stance when giving it star rankings yeah when you now that you've started putting together these lists when you're when you're on a trip, like when you come here to the rock shop, are you only looking for what you think are four or five star boulders, or do you still climb on the one star boulders? No, my standards are pretty low for what I'll climb on. <laughs> I I'm from Maryland, and we just have horrible, horrible choss all over the place. I spent like so many days of my life scrubbing boulders that should never have been touched or climbed, and. Mm -hmm. As a result, I'll climb anything, but I definitely enjoy the good ones more. So yeah, I'll usually, uh, if I take a trip to a new place, I'll usually just try to do the best of every grade first. Um, for yeah, regardless of grade, if it, I'll, if there's a bunch of amazing V6s, I'll go do all those first. Yeah. So what what are the criteria? What makes a good boulder a good boulder? Like, what are the objective criteria that you put forth yeah so we're gonna I, we're gonna call you the expert on okay what makes a good boulder for right now well there's a number of factors and you know i have them written down and my friend max zolotukin here made his <laughs> own blog post about this years ago and i think we have some pretty similar criteria overall um and it's important to note that um while all these are factors in the quality certain people weigh factors more heavily than others mm, in sure, their sure. view. So for me, the uh, the the line is like one of the most important things. Like that is the purest way to climb it. It's not contrived. For me personally, that stands out above some of the other qualities. So a pure line that doesn't have quite as good rock, I would still prefer to a really, really, like really good stone with a little bit of contrivance in the problem. And when we're saying line, are we talking like a visual line, a feature, or is it more like it's only these holds and there's no way to escape or come in from another place? Yeah, I think... A singular line. I think it's the latter mostly, but the aesthetics definitely come into play. And I think that there's... That's kind of undeniable. While it is somewhat subjective, you can argue back and forth on which boulder is prettier. You can definitely sure. objectively say that, you know, these boulders on the top 100 list are prettier than a lot of the other sure. random boulders. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you, are you saying that you weigh the quality of the line over the rock quality? Uh, it's a balance, you know, like if it's absolute garbage rock, but a super pure line, that's not necessarily better than the alternative. But for me, line is like the most important thing because when i put down my criteria i kind of weighted everything equally like right. the like six criteria that i thought were like contributed to the quality of a boulder problem and that's how i, I like allocated those criteria to each star yeah does that make sense yeah, yeah i think the same thing so, so i didn't go, go for the star ranking, ranking and i didn't try and make it like formulaic like, but if, if you're, you're going, going for it being as objective as possible, I agree that they should all be weighed equally. I'm just saying that like everyone's going to have their own implicit bias and things that they like more than other things. So each individual's preference will, will change. But doesn't that also kind of get back to um, like how movement is subjective? 
like then you're weighing things subjectively over the objectivity of like we can all like look at the same boulder problem and see the same thing right so then why should we say oh the the line is you know i think the line is more important than the quality of the rock like right, right. that's well, where the subjectivity would come into play again yeah and it's not impacting like when i made this list my own personal liking the line more than rock quality for instance that didn't come into play hmm. that's just like if i were to make my own personal list and i were to rank them it would be shown there more more evidently so the objective version weighs it equally. Yeah, I think you'd have to. But we all tend toward the subjective. Yeah, for sure. Unless and, and unless like, we try really, really hard not to. It should be clear that like there's no there's no way that you can actually make an objective list like this. Right. It's just like my best shot at it. Sure. Anything, Max? I'm just curious because Eric and I haven't actually talked about this. I yeah, mean, we've interacted. I think it's. I think it's we've, fascinating. We've interacted about it on Facebook, but um, so my the criteria that I had back in the day. I think this was 11 years ago that I wrote about this, but it's it was the quality of the line, like he was saying, the rock quality, uh, the height of the problem, uh, whether the problem had an obvious start the setting in which you were experiencing the problem so that's like the surroundings basically um in the area and then the landing of the problem so in in my system there were like an ideal of six total stars yeah but you know there wasn't a single boulder problem i don't think that exists that's like a 10 out of 10 you know sure that would be six stars on all, on all those criteria. Yep. But I did think there were differences between like five star problems and four star problems that you could find that were like, oh, this, you know, meets, this was like 0.8 out of, you know, on all these factors. So, and that would distinguish from like the really good from like the, like world-class basically. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah. The rest curious. of your criteria, did they match up with Max's or are they different? Yeah, so I, I have it written down here and I can sort of, there's a little bit of differences. So for me, uh, some of the things that Max had mentioned are included in the line. So for my criteria, height, aesthetics, location, and then obvious start are all part of the line criteria. Hmm. And then the other ones are rock quality, landing, uh, and then like uniqueness and movement come into play for subjective lists. So. Okay. Like if there's a really cool, unique hold that goes a long way for a lot of people. Sure, and sure. I think it should. Yeah. Because that makes, you know, a hold with a or a boulder with a really crazy, cool, unique hold is hold or move? Yeah, would sure. You say? That's sure. like like okay. Tequogus Gway in Colorado, that's like yeah. the foot first one. Yeah. A lot of people in Colorado really spoke highly of that boulder, and I think that it's impossible to negate that aside from the movement, you know, the rock quality looks great. But the movement is like the stellar attribute there. And I think that influences people's opinion of the problem. So I think that that should carry weight, but maybe not in this list, you know? Okay. And I think this, this sort of illustrates why it's so hard to separate an objective versus subjective list, right? Because we all have our built-in biases and we're we're going to go into every single boulder with those mm -hmm. no matter what. So it's really tough to break it down into a totally formulaic system. And that's what you were trying to do, right, Max? Mm -hmm. Make it super formulaic. I, I just thought my criteria were <clears throat> like, we can all look at the same thing and be like, okay, we're experiencing this in the same way because our senses are, you know, like we're all seeing the same line. Mm -hmm. When we're climbing, we might be experiencing it differently because, you know, we, you and I might not like the same type of movement. So, you know, something that you really like, I might not like at all and vice versa. Whereas when we're seeing the same thing, like we're objectively experiencing it in the same way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that's what I was going for. Um, but like I could see subjectivity being used as like a tiebreaker. Right. Definitely. I think. Yeah. But and to your point, like if you're comparing the movement of a boulder between two different sized people, you know, so right. really short might have to right. grab a heinously sharp crimp that the other person doesn't have to. So therefore that would change things. But I agree that what you can see <clears throat> is the best indicator of objective quality. 
so why on both of your lists, there are things like height. Why is that more objectively better to have a specific height, whatever it is? And do you both agree on the height? Hmm. That's, That's a, a good, good question, question because, because it, it is subjective, subjective in nature. Some people love low balls. Some, some people love high balls. I myself tend towards trend towards high balls. And I think that's reflected in my list a little bit. What do you I think is the to? ideal height of a boulder? I would say like for me, 18 feet is like perfect. Like you don't have to fear for your life up there. If you fall, you'll be fine, but it's still a lot of space to climb and, uh, you know, you got to keep your wits about you. I mean, I think when you come up to a problem objectively, right. And you're like, this problem is either 12 feet tall or it's 24 feet tall and all, all else things being equal, like the 24 foot tall problem is much more impressive, right. Whether like experiencing it. Yeah. There's like a bunch of subjective things. Like you need way more pads to climb on <laughs> uh, <laughs> like a super tall problem and you need a bunch of spotters. Like that's not ideal, but you know, when you see, when I, I always used to try to envision like, oh, what's like my ideal boulder problem? Like, what does it look like? Well, it's probably like 60 to 45 degrees overhanging, like 25 feet tall. Maybe the, like the landing goes up with it or something. So it's mm -hmm. not super dangerous, but mm -hmm. it still has, it's still super proud. And then it's just like a singular line of holds, right. With like bullet rock. So that's kind of like what I based all right. of that off of with like an obvious start. hold. <laughs> yeah. Speed of life. Speed of life. That was, that was, pretty that close. Was, I think that was the boulder that kind of inspired me to to come up with this list because yeah. that was when my first time walking into Farley and you like it's like such a forest it's amazing. and then you like walk around the corner and you're like what the fuck is that like yeah. does that actually exist in real life and that problem's stunning yeah, yeah. I, th I think, I think that, that like the rock quality isn't that great and you know I think, I think that the landing can in some ways detract on that one. But I agree for safety purposes, like it's nice to have. Um, but yeah, I think we can all agree that that's like an incredible problem. Landing is another one of those things. What if, you know, like you guys were climbing on the UFO boulder today. Mm -hmm. What if the landing is completely manufactured? Personally, that doesn't really bother me. I don't mind. Um, I think that it's important to note that sometimes a weird landing can positively influence the subjective fun of a boulder or its sure. uniqueness factor, such as like not slider, for me, but it can for other people. Yeah. Well, like <laughs> slider and HP 40, for instance, yeah. like, like you take a slide down this rock mm -hmm. that's adjacent to it. And that's, you know, maybe the boulder wouldn't be as famous if it weren't for that. Or right. we were talking yesterday about this boulder in a little cottonwood called night shift, where kind of the hard part is not dabbing on these rocks that are surrounding you. You're kind of cave crawling, but I thought that that added some really unique qualities to the climb that made it more fun. Like having to actually get closer to the rock than you would normally have to yeah. is a unique thing that you don't experience on like any other rock climb. So I enjoyed that, but objectively a flat landing is the best. Right. You know, right. That boulder is not going to make your objective list. Right. But it will make the subjective list. Right. No, it won't even make this <laughs> No, yeah, that one's not that good. That one's not that good. It could. Maybe it's fun. I'll say that. I enjoyed it. It though. has the potential, or that that part of it has the potential. I've climbed a lot of fun boulders that had some major dab potential. You know? Yeah, yeah. But I agree, I wouldn't put them in my top list because of that. And I think a lot of people make that mistake of saying, Oh, that's five stars because it was so much fun and they stop paying attention to did it have an obvious star hold um what's the landing like what's the you know when i walked up to this boulder was i impressed or not you know um when it's a boulder like the ufo boulder we'll use that as an example and for yeah. for everyone listening who doesn't know the ufo boulder I'm going to describe it subjectively, and then you guys tell me if you agree or not. Okay. It's when you walk up to it, it is impressive. It's a big overhanging boulder. Um, it's not as tall as you guys might like, but it probably fits exactly where I want it to be because I have old knees and I don't want to fall much further than that. It's got really cool grips, but 
it's got lines crisscrossing it every which direction and it's sort of a choose your own adventure type of boulder and and while i think i mean i love that boulder i also couldn't in good conscience give it five stars because of that choose your own adventure quality Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. so So we talked talked about that that exact exact thing this morning morning. we had the exact exact talk does giving tree belong in the top 100 100? yeah because Because that that boulder in particular had been claimed on the internet a bunch of times as like being the best v10 in the country i've heard that a lot right and i think max and i would both strongly disagree with that but yeah so subjectively that stuff is all true objectively the yeah the line that's like the biggest issue like the rock's amazing it's stunning it's a little bit shorter than I might like, but it's a great height. You climb a long distance because it's so steep. Mm-hmm. The landing's flat. There's a pretty obvious place to start and maybe not the most obvious yeah. because there's like a lower version, which yeah. also detracts in my mind from it. Yeah. But which line would be on the list? You know, there's like seven or eight variations. Yeah. And how do you distinguish the best? We were talking about if only one line on that boulder could exist, which one would be the best? Like if the other holds didn't exist... And we decided that smoking the tree would be the best because it goes directly up the middle all the way. Mm-hmm. Whereas the giving tree bails out right, land of the free bails out left. Yeah. And the low start is kind of inobvious and dumpy and just had some silly moves in. It's not as obvious of a place to start. And there's a way to bail out right even earlier. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. so because of all those reasons, it, it just like it simply can't be on the top 100 list, but it's a freaking amazing boulder. It's so much fun. It's like phenomenal. And everyone should go do it. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Those are your thoughts as well, Max? Yeah, totally. I mean, I was, it was funny because I was saying the giving tree, which is the one, you know, that the bowler is named after seems like the most contrived line because it's the one that, uh, the, the other, the harder variations finish in different places, but it's the easiest way to get from point A to point B. Whereas with the giving tree, there's actually an easier way to get to to end up in the same place. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of ironic it's it seems like the most squeezed in of the lines there (laughs) yeah i agree completely and for me you know because that's like at my project level you know v10 v11 is my top level for me it becomes this really cloudy place when i'm climbing on it because i'm like do i just have to do the same exact beta as the person who did it originally because if i do this slight different bit of beta I'm sort of trending into another one of the variations. So Mm -hmm. how does that look, you know? And so it's a confusing place to be in my head until I had that realization. I'm like, Oh, this is one of the best boulders I've ever climbed on. And now I'm like, I don't know so much anymore. You know, I love climbing on it, but is it one of the best I've climbed on? I, I think for me, some of my like least favorite climbing or bouldering experiences that I've had have been with lines that have had um, where you walk up to it and maybe you don't have enough information about how the line was climbed and right. then you misinterpret right. like either how it started or where it finished, like if there were like holds that were on or off and that kind of like detracts from the line if if you're like, oh, I started it. Oh, actually this person started like much lower in this like yeah. super in obvious place and, <clears throat> and climbed into like the obvious start. And that's always a bummer that, you know, that, that, that for me like takes away stars from a problem for sure. Yeah. That's a really good way to think about it. And it might, you know, help to define the line as you're calling it. And, and it fits several of the, of your categories max that if you can walk up with no information and know exactly where to start and exactly where to climb yeah exactly that's definitely a better experience than Mm -hmm. like i don't know do i start here am i starting one move in i can't really tell you know that's always a weird experience and definitely detracts yeah i agree i think the purest way you can climb something is there's one place to start and one place to finish and you know you don't have the option of bailing or starting a little lower to the right you just you walk up, you pull on and and you go to the top and that's it, you know? Yeah. If that brings up an interesting question, is there even a place on either of your lists for a drop off boulder? <laughs> can it, can it ever, if all the other boxes are checked, can a drop off boulder even make the list? It can't make it because 
uh, you know, there is one like that in the New River Gorge called Spinal Remains. That's amazing in every way, but it's a drop off, and I didn't put it on there simply mm-hmm. because of that. You know? Yeah, definitely not the top hundred. Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of good, I mean, awesome drop Esperanza is like incredible and like has a great history. But that's cool. Mm-hmm. That's cool. You know, I I want one, one thing. Way go. <laughs> well, yeah, one thing that uh. I was pretty adamant about in making the list was that history should not play a role Mm. in determining the best boulders. I agree. Like it's, it doesn't matter that midnight lightning was midnight lightning. If it's not a good boulder, it's not a good boulder. Yeah. I'm not saying midnight lightning is not a good boulder. I'm sure it's great. Midnight light, midnight lightning is like the eighth best V8 in the Valley or something. It's (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah. not that incredible for sure. Do you ever go out on trips, you know, brought up by midnight lightning do you ever go out and seek out boulders that you know aren't on the list but just because you want to do them absolutely yeah for sure like gill egg in the gunks i was like most excited yeah to do that boulder when i went there and it's kind of a yeah. shitty boulder but i'm psyched i did it i did gill egg you know it's gill egg yeah for sure i think a lot of people and i've seen this a number of times get trapped into this like romanticizing the best boulders And I, you know, while I love this kind of a list, I do think there's some danger in these lists for some people who are like, I only want to climb the best things. You know, I have to be really inspired to go out and climb something. And I think that that makes it a harder for them to keep progressing. Mm -hmm. I think it's tough to have a larger perspective if you only limit yourself to what you've heard is the best. So do you feel like there's a danger in it? Yeah, sure. I mean, I definitely have friends uh, who only want to climb five-star boulders, and therefore they're just not having fun most of the time because there's not that many five-star boulders. And if you lower your standards, I think this goes, this is true all around. If you have low standards for boulders, you're going to have a good time. You're going to get stronger. You're going to experience more climbing. You're going to... You're going to just enjoy yourself more. You're going to be able to go out and climb on bad boulders like we did yesterday in Little Cottonwood. We climbed we climbed some first ascents in Little that were like maybe maybe four feet tall. These caves. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I do that all the time at the rock shop. I had a great time. All know? the dirt burglars. Um, I'm on the hunt for them all the time. Yeah. But exactly. That's exactly. I wish you all could see this photo because that's exactly the kind of boulder I'm looking for. When I, when I have to lay down and I can barely keep my back from hitting the ground while I'm climbing. I love that shit. And I feel like I get a lot out of it. Actually. It makes me, it makes me appreciate the really amazing boulders even more because I can have fun on this one star piece of junk, you know, that may never ever be climbed again. And then when I do get the chance to climb on one of these really amazing boulders, it makes it all that much more special. Yeah, absolutely. I I think originally when I made my list, it was a little bit in response to like 8A culture. And part of it was trying to shift the focus away. And like, like I certainly climb on plenty of boulders that are not that great, like all the time. And Mm -hmm. I enjoy movement and like solving problems more than anything. But the, the part of it that I wanted to like shift focus towards is like quality Mm -hmm. and not towards Mm -hmm. difficulty. Cause I was like back in the day, I would just get frustrated seeing people like climb soft problems and like, like feeling like they had accomplished a lot. I mean, that sounds kind of shitty, but like more like I, I wish that they had focused on like climbing the best problems in an area rather than, cause I would see people like come to an area that I would climb at and like seek out the problems that they knew were easy for the grade. Right. Right. Sure. And, and I do that as well. Like if I'm trying to break into a new grade, I'm certainly going to seek out the easy ones, you know? Sure. But but I, I think I can also distinguish between, am I there searching for difficulty purely or do I want to go out and climb great boulders? And ideally I search for the easy ones and that leads me into being able to do the better ones, you know? That's fair. Yeah. So is there then a danger with these sort of lists and saying, these are the best boulders, these are the ones you should go do with, 
I mean, lots of people are afraid of this whole overcrowding thing. Does it make it worse for the best boulders if more people are climbing them? I think it can. I mean, um, like holds do change. People... Were you were you climbing on Golden Harvest the season? That... Okay, that's a good example. That's a great example. Okay. So... Wait, what were you going to say? Well, there was, there's one hold on gold, Golden Harvest that seems like it's like had POF or something on it. And it's super, super polished, which is strange for Southern Sandstone. And, and I'm just curious what happens when we brush a hold every single time someone touches it. You know, um, like if you look at all the other holds on the boulder, they rarely get brushed. And they're all totally fine and still have the same texture. But I watched several days people climbing on Golden Harvest, and every time someone would fall, they would brush that hold. Yeah. And that hold mm -hmm. is super polished and has gotten more polished over the years. So yeah, just curious, does that change a boulder by directing so many people toward it? I think I think it does have an influence. Like, first of all, I think brushing holds is good overall. Um, Agreed. You should brush them. Agreed. But like, there should also be more cleaning of holds with water. Um, like getting the gunk out of there, but that's another issue. But Golden Harvest is a great example because I only ever tried it after it had been super glassed up, right? And that negatively influenced, yeah, my opinion of it, yeah. Um, both objectively and subjectively, like I just wasn't having fun because it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think like people are grabbing a different hold now that's like has texture still, yeah, could be rather than know. one of like the originally used holds and i don't think i've been back there since the time i climbed on it with you oh yeah so um you know that boulder's famous because it has like 26 and a half stars in the guidebook right right <laughs> everybody just sort of takes that and is like yeah it must be the best boulder ever it's golden harvest but it's really it's not that amazing you know like the worst part about that boulder for me is you walk up and you have no idea where to where start, to start. It. Like, yep. even looking at the guidebook and like having people tell me like i still don't really know where to start it right i think the problem to the left golden showers the v5 is really great mm -hmm. but yeah i think um you know you can't really avoid people going and climbing and you know holds will change texture will change we can all just like do our best to spread good uh climbing ethics and understand the principles of cleaning holds and everything but i'm not gonna like discourage people from going to do a good boulder because of a fear of that you know yeah well now that we've completely disparaged midnight lightning and golden harvest <laughs> what other boulders were heavily suggested that you think definitely do not make the list oh man it's it there were a bunch it's it's hard to remember because it was uh it was a while ago now, and I haven't thought about this for a long time now, but big controversial ones are like Roses and Blue Jays and Wet Dream for the same reason. And it's because, you know, they're incredible. They're amazing. They're some of the best problems in the country. But for me, you know, someone who carries line over everything, both problems are contrived. Like there's no mm. left or right about it. They're like they're contrived. And so when I engage the community I asked you know do these boulders belong on the list a lot of people said no a lot of people said yeah yes it was pretty split and uh in the end I, I did keep them on the list because they're they are amazing they're so good in all the other factors like the rock is so good it's so pretty they're so proud that they deserve to make it but super contrived yeah yeah you were you were ifing back and oh, forth I mean, Max. I, just, I think yeah, those two in particular, the shield and wet dream are like, I always thought of them as like, on all the other factors, they were so far ahead of most of the other problems that were on my list, that the fact that they were contrived, um, <clears throat> what like, super, like, the their quality superseded the fact that they were contrived, and they were still like, there wasn't anything that was still like pushing past them. But this yeah. was like a few years ago. So there might be things now yeah. that are new that have superseded that but i agree and it's like the argument you know people were mad were arguing that like it doesn't matter it doesn't affect it that you can go right on wet dream or that you can go into something from nothing on roses and blue jays but my argument is that if wet dream right if the holds weren't there and if nocturnal emissions holds weren't there well i, I personally think nocturnal emissions like looks like a more obvious place to start there's like this big shield feature but that's besides the point if there was just one place to start and go up you can't really argue that it wouldn't be better for it Sure. I'm curious, did you have 
uh, through all of your research? Did you have like one problem that came out that you were like, this seems like all the factors point towards this being, and, and we're, I'm going to limit this to the like U S the best problem. Yeah. Just in the U S cause that's okay. like mostly where our opinions are coming from. Yeah. Yeah. I also have a world's list in the, in the making. <laughs> it's really daunting and scary to work on that. Yeah. Um, we just but, need you to get injured again so you can work on the list. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, and they're, and they're always in progress too. I should note like this top 100 list is constantly changing. Sure. Like, I haven't been to a lot of these problems. So yeah, when I see a problem, it might, go up or down on the list in my mind and uh that's why i asked the opinion of so many people like i reached out to daniel and paul and jimmy like all the pro climbers i had all these hundreds of pro climbers hitting me up in my dms telling me what they think is the best boulder and it's good because they've climbed the most things like they have the best idea and then i would also hit up people who were regionally like experts you know the like i know nothing about I shouldn't say that and kind of know a lot about it, but um, <laughs> I've never been to North Carolina to climb, but you know, I hit up all the people who have developed the climbing in North Carolina and asked for their opinions and got, tried to get a good grasp of quality across the country. And, uh, and I worked with Brian Nugent really closely on the list. He's, mm-hmm. I don't know if a lot of people out on the internet know him. He doesn't have like a huge internet presence, but he's a legend. He's, you know famous now for having flash specter mm. which is like the most fucked up shit anybody's ever done it's like a v13 in bishop that's very high on the list if anybody was wondering and it, it takes you know pro climbers a long time to do that boulder it's a freaking hard boulder and yeah. he flashed it and he's amazing um and he's also a huge climbing nerd and he's climbed a lot of these boulders a lot of them and he's traveled more than i have so we worked pretty closely on the list together And when it came to the ranking, I sort of defaulted to him in a lot of instances because he had been to more of them and done more of them. I think right now, as it stands, like the shining path in Red Rocks is the top of the list, but I strongly disagree with that. Max Max also strongly disagrees with that. Hard disagree. Uh, Hard disagree. You know, a lot of people who'd done it said this is the best, like Pablo and and just a bunch of people. But I, I, you know, the landing's not that good. It's maybe you know, too tall for comfort if that's the objective quality of it. And uh, the rock's just not that good on it. But if we're talking about the best in the country, I haven't been to Sunseeker, but I feel like Sunseeker could definitely be up there. I did Western Gold and and Osiris the last time I went to the south where, you know, now these lists are informing my, my goals sure. when I make trips. Like, why wouldn't I do the best ones? Mm-hmm. So I went to the south for a couple of weeks and got m- like two days of climbing because it was raining so much. But I was able to do Osiris and Western Gold and this thing called Dragon Ball, which were all tentatively on the list. And they're amazing. Western Gold, I think a lot of people have claimed that to be the best boulder in the country. It's phenomenal. I think that you could go left into this crack system and it would be easier than doing Western Gold. Other than that, it's pretty incredible. Um I really loved Osiris, but it has the same issue. You can go left, and it's and it's easier. They're better than the shield? Yeah, I think so. Mm. The shield, okay. Another element that I started talking to people about, which I think is pretty valuable, is the, like a bell curve of the difficulty. So some people expressed the opinion that there would be like a perfect bell curve that of difficulty that makes the problem the best. Like it's, it's if with the shield, for instance, it's really easy into like, a one or two move crux and then it's over. And I'd argue that it would be better if it were more consistent, if it were like you had to try and then you try for the crux, like right in the middle, like, you know, three quarters of the way up the boulder. And then it's still kind of on you at the end. And I think Western gold has the perfect bell curve. Like it starts off like the first moves chill. It's like a setup move. And then it's pretty hard. Maybe like V seven V eight, you do the crux and then you've got like V six V seven top out. That's still on you. You still have to try. And I think that that is, goes a long way when comparing to something like the shield. And does that bell curve work for any grade? Like, sure. could a V6 be the best boulder in the country? Yeah, absolutely. Fort Rasta. That's the best V6. Where's Fort Disagree. Rasta? It's on the <laughs> northern California coast. At, yeah, it's called, the area is called Fort Ross. It's like an hour and a half north of San Francisco. It's like a singular <clears throat> Joe's Valley style boulder on a flat beach. 
Hmm. And it's like a perfect like 20 foot line starting on like a jug. And then you do like big moves on like flat holds and then like, yeah. Yeah. That one does look amazing. My, my top V6 is Scud Buster in the new. It's like stunning rail feature. It's one rail that follows up this giant clean face for maybe 25 feet. It's quite tall and it's got that bell curve. It's, it's really, really excellent, but I haven't done for Rasta. It looks amazing. The uh, the bell curve idea is really interesting. I had not thought of that before. I was when you were talking about it, I was thinking of Wet Dream, which is basically like every single move is the exact same grade. It's like <laughs> right. It's like eighteen v seven moves in a row. Yeah. Which is also like I think that's also I don't know if it's as cool as like the bell curve idea, but yeah. you're right. Like for sure, that makes Wet Dream better than the Shield in my mind is the fact that it is like you can do every single move in isolation, like without too right. much difficulty, but then doing like all of them back to back to back to back. It's like, yeah, it makes it so And amazing. then the shield's like not that fun to try because you just climb this V7 and then fall over and over and over again. It is subjective. Yeah, for right. sure. What's but, interesting uh, actually that like you, you mentioned that's more impressive or that's more appealing about wet dream because that's, like if you go to Red River Gorge, if we're talking roots, that's the thing that is the big detractor. Mm. Like every move is V3, so yeah. then it becomes no fun. I, th I think yeah. it is like a, a subjective factor. It's personal. Yeah. Some people love like one move crux boulders, but I think <clears> like the vast majority of people would probably agree with the bell curve thing. Like that, that is more yeah, fun to I, climb on. I do think like, it's a super interesting idea. Dragon Ball was the same. It, it like looks so stunning and Alex, my friend Alex Brown put it up, but like nobody had gone to repeat it pretty much. And I was like, well, I got to go do it. And you hike like really far and it kind of sucks. And then you get there and it's stunning, but it's like V3 into a one or two movie 11. And right. so while the V3 is really amazing and fun, I don't think it's quite as cool as Osiris where it's like first move is pretty easy. You try hard for a few minutes, you do the crux, and then you're like met with a techie hard mantle at the top. Right. That is <clears throat> full value the whole way like the v3 at the bottom of dragon ball i would do it differently every time because it didn't matter like they were jugs i could put my feet wherever it didn't require my focus in the same way yeah and so therefore i wasn't as present i wasn't enjoying it quite as much i think as osiris now is there when we're trying to look at this objectively is there a level of climber that we're comparing it to like for instance wet dream being v7 moves over and over jimmy's not going to be challenged by v7 moves over and over daniel's not going to be that challenged by v7 moves over and over i'm going to be extremely challenged by v7 moves over and over so are we considering like one grade above two grades above what's the what's the category we're looking at there I think part of the problem with the whole top hundred list is I, I don't know when I was putting it together um, a while ago, I was noticing that it leaned heavily towards the more difficult problems, like the double digit problems. And I think that's largely a byproduct of the fact that some of the criteria that being like the totally. line and the yep. height, like those things, like when you have a problem like speed of life, that's literally like, you know, a full pad edge and then five, there's like no holds for five feet. And then you have like another full pad edge and then that to the top, like you, it's much harder to find a boulder problem. That's like moderate or easy. Right. That is like a singular feature and then, you know, no holds and then another singular feature, which kind of makes for the best lines. Mm -hmm. So just by that virtue, I feel like the better problems tend to be harder. So that's kind of, I don't, I don't know if that detracts from the uh, the objectivity, but I feel that's just kind of how like things sure, break down. And, sure. and that should inspire people, I think. Yep, I think so. I agree. I mean, that's one of the things that when I talk to my clients, it's often, oh, I went to this crag or I went to this boulder field and I saw this thing and it looked amazing. You know, why do all the hardest things look the coolest? Mm -hmm. and and they're excited to try these harder things or get to the level where they can try these harder things because they look cooler 
And I think that it's almost a, you know, this linear scale where it's like V5 looks cooler than V2 and V8 looks cooler than V5 and V12 looks cooler than V8, you know, Mm. not, you know, not every boulder, but, but the best ones do, I think a lot of the time. Yeah. I think generally speaking, I'd agree with you. We also haven't really talked about top outs and you just talked about a, a technical mantle and you know having been a southern climber for a lot of my life there are some top outs on some really great boulders that end up for even the best climbers just becoming these beached whale moments does that detract uh not in an objective sense okay <laughs> Subje- there were subjectively, I will say that I uh, love juggy top outs and uh, hate <laughs> beach whale top outs. <laughs> subjectively, I disagree. I love mantles. Now there was, I don't know. I'm sure I don't know if Eric, if you're old enough or had you know was paying enough attention at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, Max, you might remember uh, quite a while ago on Jamie Emerson's B3 bouldering blog. Mm-hmm. I think it was on there. There was a conversation about using your knees on a top out <laughs> does not count. Just doesn't, it, it's not a thing. You, you can't count a boulder if you touched your knee to the top out. What if that happens and does that, how do you feel about that? And should it, like if you have to use a knee, if that's the easiest way to do a top out, does that make the boulder less cool? I love that deep cut, first of all, and there were, a lot of, <laughs> there were a lot of things said on Jamie's blog that, you know, looking back now, seem pretty ridiculous. But no, I, I don't think the climbing, the way you, the style of how you climb something does not impact the quality okay. of it for sure. And, you know, I mean, people, people definitely have different ethics, like, you know, the British, like they're like, oh, you know, don't use a knee pad or, I mean, I know plenty of people who are kind of like against, but I think we've kind of moved past that now. And yeah, I think most people are in consensus on knee bars at this point. Yeah, I think so. Can I completely switch topics here Sure. because of this knee pad conversation and you two are deep (laughs) thinkers in the bouldering world. So I'm, I'm curious where your stance lies on this. On knee bars. Not on just knee bars, but on the idea that a lot of old classic, like let's take Waco, for example. I've I've mentioned this enough on the podcast that people have heard it, but I've, I've spent a few seasons in Waco where a lot of people were saying, you should go do this V12. It's way easier now with this knee bar. And the I'm butter like, pumper. I'm like, exactly. That's one of them. <laughs> Like, do you hear what you're saying? You just said yeah. it's easier. V12 is a an expression of its difficulty. So if it's easier, it's no longer V12. How do you feel about the, we'll call it a technological advance of like send climbing pads and how they've made a lot of boulders easier? Is that a good thing, a bad thing, or just a thing? So I think it's good for the future of the sport, like by any means necessary is kind of how I would approach it. Um, and if the boulder's easier, it's easier. Like the yeah. easiest grade is the grade that it is, I think. And it can get a little cloudy. Like if someone who's taller than literally right. everyone else sure. can reach past it, then does it change the grade for everyone else? But I think in large, a knee bar that downgrades the boulder should downgrade it. And then if you want, you know, to personally challenge yourself to do, you know, the butter pumper without the knee bar and make it feel like V12, that's on you, but you can't take 12 points for it. Oh, you can't take the points. I don't think so. I mean, you, you can tell yourself. Even if you put in your and, and if comment and if that it's you v, did it that way. You know, it, it is V12 that way, but I think the easiest grade is, is what it is. And I, I've opted to not use knee bars plenty of times because I don't, I've gotten more into them over time. But like, there's a boulder in Little that like got kind of controversial called Spinal Twist, where I got hated on a bit and was like kind of trolled for uh, 
Eric, Eric insisted on climbing his V his first V13 the hard way. Yeah. Without without the knee bar that everyone uses now that wasn't originally used. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's just like Chris Sharma Boulder and Little Cottonwood. It's kind of cool, but uh, you know this. Old so did you school, take the grade? Uh, so, so people, people take V13 with, with or without the knee bar. bar. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think that... Just trying to set the record straight here. Uh, I think, <clears throat> you know, I, I didn't really try it with the knee bar. I think it's probably harder without it because, like, the first move without the knee bar is, like, a single move. I'd call it, like, single move V11 maybe. And it took me, like, a whole session to do that move. And uh, if you plug the knee, you just kind of reach that hold and then depending on your shin decks and there's a, a lot of different ways of doing it now but it, you have to do a really technical foot walk that like mm-hmm. kind of sucks and your feet pick and it tears your shoe up and so for me the reason i opted to not use the knee bar was a number of factors um one the guy who showed it to me is a friend graham who'd done it many many years ago he's like a local legend and uh he didn't do the knee bar and he was like really excited to show me and i right he's right. like this is the beta and this is how you do it and i was like all right and i didn't own an e-bar pad at the time i just like had come from maryland where climbing was less of a scene and like didn't know that much about knee barring even and i thought the move was badass it's like this dope bicep lunge to a cool pinch it's really hard it was originally done without the knee bar and because it was the first of a grade for me i wanted like no question in my mind that i was climbing a v13 you know right, right. like i didn't want I didn't want to feel like, oh, I knee barred, maybe it's V12, you know? And uh, and it was freaking cool that way. And the alternative was the knee bar where the crux then becomes like a technical footwalk that everyone seems to hate. And I didn't want to do that. I'd rather do it a harder way that's more fun. And But, it, you know, if with the knee bar it were V12, I, what I climbed would be V12. Spinal Twist is V12, you know? Sure. I'm I'm gonna go on record and say that knee bars are the future, and I think more people will be using more and more knee bars. I like the older I'm in my mid 30s now, and I feel like 10 years ago I like would knee bar like I don't know once every two or three months or something, and I right. feel like now I wear at least one knee pad on like over 50 percent of like right. what I'm climbing on, and it just like feels like the way my body moves now is really natural to seek that kind of tension and mm-hmm. just take weight off. I don't know. I my local project that I have in Salt Lake, I wear three knee pads on. So <laughs> <laughs> can we just explain how that works for a second? <laughs> uh two of the knee pads are st- stacked on top of one another to create like a an extra little yeah, bit of depth. A, another quarter inch of add to thickness. your shindex. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not quite there yet. I, I, I acknowledge that I acknowledge that knee barring is the future and I'm trying to get better at it because it is a skill and I realized that part of the reason I didn't like it before was because I was bad at it. I'd really enjoy the knee bars that were just like you didn't even have to think about it. It's like your whole knee fits in there. But there's a lot of boards with really techy, hard knee bars and it is a skill and I think that's a really fun element of climbing is like finding these new little technical challenges. So I'm trying to challenge myself to get better at it, but I definitely don't jump at the opportunity. I rarely use my knee pad as it is. Yeah, knee, knee pads kind of, knee pads and like the new knee bar um, ideas sort of fucked me up because I used to, I took the approach of I'm always just taking guidebook grades no matter what they are because it's such a cloudy, weird thing to navigate. <laughs> but then, like my second season in Waco, I climbed several boulders that I was like, I can't even feel good about taking these guidebook grades mm-hmm. because they're so different with the knee bar versus how Fred did it originally right. or whatever. You know, so and I that's think it's not, a tricky thing. That's not <laughs> your fault. That's Fred's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fred, you should have been thinking forward. <laughs> Do so knee bars Mm -hmm. for some people take away from the quality of a boulder. Mm -hmm. You two don't see it that way. No, I don't think you can. Uh, Again, like that's subjective. Like Griffin is like the best boulder in the world. Doesn't use knee bars. He refuses to, even if it makes the problem much, much harder. (laughs) For instance, he repeated creature of the black lagoon, which is a V16 in Rocky Mountain national park without any knee bars. Whereas Daniel and Jimmy and all these other ascensionists put in a knee bar, rested for a really long time, like kept going, put in another knee bar. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't change the quality. It also doesn't change the grade. Like even though maybe Griff's 
way of doing it is like be 17 then it's you know still be 16 though yeah but i think it is important to acknowledge the style with which someone climbs something if they choose not to use the knee bar i think it's valid for you to be like yeah they didn't use the knee bar. I was fucked up I, sorry uh i don't know if this is totally off topic but something maybe we've talked about before but do you feel like people climbers uh have different styles like they used to i feel like when i started climbing they're different like pro level climbers sure. or elite climbers mm -hmm. had very distinct climbing styles yeah and i feel like i don't notice that so much anymore i feel like everyone's <clears throat> kind of maybe because gyms it's becoming have advanced. homogenous yeah um but when when we were growing up like there were people that i looked up to um wills young i remember like really looking up to because he was like so this light on really his feet. flowy style yeah, yeah. exactly or Ty climbing with Ty Landon like back in the mid 2000s like it was also like super unique with just like everything was wide like everything was like jumping and just right. like but I feel like now when I watch elite climbers everyone kind of climbs the same and maybe that's climbing gyms I don't know if that's like mm. off topic but that's something that's I a good question I hadn't really thought about it but the first thing that comes to mind is that now I think as climbing is advanced, people are seeing that the way forward is to be well-rounded. Yeah. And so, you know, filled in the gaps there's, yeah, the there's a huge <laughs> emphasis on acknowledging your weaknesses and working on them. Whereas in the past, it was like, if you could get by climbing V10, you were a pro climber and OB carry on could jump between all the holds and scream and get by. And that was good enough. But now it's not really good enough. You gotta be, you gotta be fucking good. And so yeah. we're all working on our weaknesses and trying to be as well-rounded as possible. And I think that can account for that in large part. Yeah, I, I I bet that's that's where my mind went as well, mm -hmm. is that people are spending a lot of time really filling in the gaps. And we get to see all the other styles so much more readily. And after we were able to see it all, people started mimicking those things, you know, and realizing, oh, I could get better if I were able to do that and if I were able to do this. And I remember an article um, years ago about... Uh, Joe, Dave, and Luke. And in the article, they talked about when we're in the gym, we'll do a boulder the way we would do it, but then we'll also do it the way Chris would do it or the way Francois would do it mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, totally. and they would try to imitate these styles. And I think that's just evolved into having a more complete movement package. And maybe we're, maybe we're approaching like, people having the complete movement package. I don't have a clue what that might look like or who it might be. Mm -hmm. Adam Andrew. <laughs> Adam. Yeah. 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 Good point. And, you know, so maybe we're hitting that like Zenith of, of movement, or maybe there's something new waiting in the wings that we haven't seen yet at all. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we're approaching it, I'd say. Sure. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of cool. It's also kind of, I don't know, I personally like seeing the variation in styles between climbers. Like, that was really cool to me. I do, too. But, yeah, um, I, you know, a lot of the climbers that stand out to me are, like, Fred has an obvious style that mm -hmm. he climbs in, you know. I remember watching Ron Kaut climb the first times I saw him climb and thinking that he was super unique, you know. So that stands out. And I hadn't really thought of it until you just brought it up. That yeah. It's sort of homogenized. I, th I think, it, you know, there are still styles, though, for sure. Like, sure. I love thuggy compression boulders on big holes, and Max mm -hmm. is, like, a tech technical expert. And when we've been climbing on the, the Woody together recently, it's, like, pretty clear that we favor different types of moves and styles yeah. and would approach the same move differently. And that's the same with everyone else I've been sessioning with on the Woody lately. Like we all approach the problems differently and the problems we set reflect our styles. I, I think what you said about like emphasizing strengths is totally right. Cause that's like exactly what people used to do is like they would figure out what they were good at and then they would just like push that, Seek push that, push that, that right, and yeah. like try to excel at that one style. And now, especially like the elite climbers, like if you're trying to climb in competitions, like that's no longer an option, right? Because right. you right. have to do like every single type of boulder, like as you get on the wall and it kind of like eliminates that part of like, oh, when I started climbing, like I was really good at crimping, but now I have to, you know, paddle dino. So yep. Yep. yeah. And I think it's cooler to be well-rounded. Like 
I personally have huge discrepancies. I'm really strong in compression and I'm pretty weak on crimps and, and stuff you have to wrap your thumb on. And so, you know, while I could just go out and only try like V14 and V15 compression bowlers and like probably yeah. do some of them, I think it's cooler that I go to Joe's Valley and get shit on by like crimpy V11 frequently because I, for, for me, climbing is like a pursuit of mastery and I want to feel as though I can climb any boulder of any grade if I'm inspired by it. And so, you know, recently I have been trying to like push it within my style a little bit. It's hard in Utah because there's like no compression boulders, but, uh, <laughs> You know, I'll fly to France and do the big yeah. island or something one day. Maybe. Yeah, that's interesting <laughs> because I'm, you know, I'm a big advocate of mastery and, you know, shoring up those weaknesses. And my strengths and weaknesses are the same as yours, just down several notches. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I want to get better at full crimping, but I'm 45. I turned 46 this year. My my time to climb my hardest boulders is limited. So I'm like. When I go outside, I'm mostly looking for the compression boulders mm -hmm. because I want to climb harder boulders and I feel like I'm running out of time, you know, and I'm spending my time in the gym on a lot of crimp boulders. Yeah. So it's, it's super interesting to see how you're approaching it, where you're at versus me feeling like I'm nearing the end of my line here. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it all depends on your goals. Like for me. The biggest goal when I when I started climbing it was like D15 because that was kind of the hardest thing mm -hmm. in like 2012 when I started. Maybe it's like Joya was like the one V16. Right, that thing sucks. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, that was like you know V15. Like I never ever list. ever thought it would be possible. And you know now that I've climbed a couple like squeezy V14s, I'm like, oh okay, I can like definitely climb harder than this within my style. But it's kind of less appealing of a challenge now to me because it's one it feels like somewhat attainable mm -hmm. and i don't know the top 100 list is just like a more complete package of what i want to get out of climbing like i want to see all those beautiful places i want to see all those problems i want to experience all of them and so for me it's better for me to focus on being well-rounded so that i can climb you know most of those boulders on the list are like v13 and below so it's like if i can climb v13 in every style then in theory i should be able to do most of the boulders on that list and then i can die happy or whatever yeah totally you're, you're putting a lot of your life's happiness on these boulders. <laughs> yeah, no. I like the it's, commitment. It's kind of fucked up. I don't really <laughs> like anything other than rock climbing. I'm all in. So uh, one more question while I've got you both here, since you're both super climbing nerds and think a lot about this stuff. Sure. We've talked a little bit about how... You know, Max brought up this homogenization of, of styles, which I think is super interesting. And I'm curious whether you think that, A, did the access to beta videos on almost everything anymore contribute to that? And B, in the grand scheme of things, are beta videos a good thing or a bad thing? Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I think beta videos are a good thing because it's just going to push everyone up. You know, mm -hmm. if you have to spend two less sessions on a boulder to figure it out, then you can climb harder. And I found personally that I went through periods of time where I really heavily rely on beta videos. I, I really like the, uh, the flashing challenge, the challenge of flashing boulders. So like there was a period of time where I'd study the video so intently and then give my flash burn. And, uh, I was a little worried for a while that that was, um, worsening my ability to read a boulder problem naturally. Right. But then, you know, I've been doing more development recently and I've been challenging myself to not look at videos ahead of time. And I found that my skill to read is still there. You know, it doesn't, it hasn't really gotten worse, I don't think. And maybe it would have had I been watching beta videos that intently from the get go and never had experienced that challenge of figuring it out on my own. Sure. But, uh, I think for the most part, it's like good to have it. You can also cater your beta videos to your style. Like I choose mm. to watch like, you know, when I go to Colorado, there's like two guys, Jeremy Fullerton and Nick Chavez. And like, they have very similar appearing body types to me. And they, I always just watch their beta videos and do exactly what they do. And I do the bowlers faster. So, right. 
Um, personally, I think it can be limiting at least for like what I feel like <clears throat> I excel at is being able to read the boulders and like find the beta better than most people because I've mm. root set for a really long time. And mm -hmm. like, that's what I did in my job every day was like, try to figure out the easiest way to do something. So at least for me, like I, I've noticed people have like preconceived notions of problems and how to do them. And I've had at least personally, I've had multiple experiences where I've seen <clears throat> over and over, there was like the one way to do the problem. And then I come up to the problem and I'm like, oh, there's this like other way that maybe right. isn't super obvious, but to me, like I'm like trained in trying to find that those easier ways and I find it pretty quickly. And then it, the problem's just easier. And I'm always like, man, it's really weird. Like people just get in this kind of like same mindset of I have to do it this one way that it's been done mm. before where there could yep. be and often it's a knee bar but not not always you know like there's other there's other ways so I, I there's definitely like value in that but I don't know I think uh, that's a really good point I've definitely fallen into the trap of being like oh well this is how everyone's done it so this is how I'm going to do it and I try it like that for a long long time only to then challenge myself to do it in a way that, you know, would suit me better, that had I not had the beta video, I probably would have just done it that way to begin with, like a high heel hook instead of the toe hook or whatever. And so it's, it, it can be easy to fall in that, to that trap and that is limiting, I, I'd agree. And I would like, I would also say to keep an open mind, I've, I often climb with my girlfriend and um, she has like a very different size body than me. She's like five one and and I've been climbing three times longer than her, but she's definitely had times where she was like, you should try this. And I'm like, I kind of brush it off at first being like, well, you know, like, I think I know better because, right. you know, I, I know what my body is like, right. but like, there have been like quite a few times where something seemed ridiculous. And then I tried it and I was like, oh, actually like that like works, you know? Yep. Mm -hmm. And like <clears throat> just keeping an open mind to people who have suggestions, even if they may seem like they don't like it might not fit your box or it might seem ridiculous at first, you know, just that exploration of the movement is like really exciting and you shouldn't be limited by like the things you've seen before. Yep, absolutely. And you know, one of my favorite things to do, um, my wife projects around like the V six level and, and those are the things that I'm really comfortable on. So while I'm spending time near her project, I'll, come up with other beta or creative solutions and I, I challenge myself to find out how many different solutions I can come up with to this boulder you know mm -hmm. and just recently I've realized shit if I apply that same same mindset to harder boulders all of a sudden it opens up these options I hadn't thought about because mm -hmm. I'm like I want to do this v11 so I'm going to watch these videos and this is how you do it and if I stop thinking out of the box, I'm just limiting myself. So I, I think you're both right. I think it, you know, they're a super positive thing and they can be a, a super negative thing as well. Yeah. And, and maybe they are a contributor to this homogenous style that we're seeing because so many people just look at the videos and say, here's how I'm going to do it. And everybody's wildly strong these days. So yeah. right. they can just do the beta, <laughs> you know, they don't yeah. have to find a way to fit it. Yeah. Well, they're going to get old one day. They'll they say. are. It's, that's factual. <laughs> yeah. I can I can attest to that. <laughs> so before before we wrap this up, because I've got you here, Max, can we talk about the formula? <laughs> oh, yeah, we can. Sure. Because I think the formula is fascinating. When I first read it on your blog a long time ago, I was like, "No, that doesn't work," <laughs> and I wasn't a boulder at all. But. Now that I'm more into bouldering and I'm trying to like avoid the old folks retirement endurance home uh, by bouldering harder in my mid forties, I'm spending more time around people who are well versed in bouldering. And I've heard your formula broken out at the boulders <laughs> multiple times. And I'm like, is that a thing? And every single time it works. So <laughs> only, curious. only within the love, the limits of, objectivity of climbing grading right which is sure to say it's subjective right. <laughs> yeah so but within the limits of like the average body type and and what have you um yeah it was basically um i just always felt intuitively that you know you could break down 
a boulder problem into its different parts and that the different parts of the boulder, like down to a single move, each move on the boulder problem has its own grade, right? We all know that, you know, there can be like a V6 dyno and that's like one V6 move, obviously, right? right? Um, but if you link two V6 moves in a row, it's actually not V6 anymore, right? Because right. now you're stacking difficulty. Um, it actually turns out to be V8, which is seems counterintuitive, but that's actually the case. Um, so yeah, I think back in 2009, I had broken my leg and I was just like laying around all day. And, and I think I was back in the, I was probably close to your age, maybe a little older at the mm -hmm. time, but also like thinking a lot about climbing. And I came up with this equation that was basically, um, if you combine two, two contingent parts of the boulder, um, and it would be X, the grade X plus Y, and then you divide that by two and then you add two and then you get the full grade. So the easiest examples are basically like V nine plus V nine is V 11. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, V nine plus V seven is V 10. Right. Now, did you like reverse engineer this formula? Did you look at a V 11 and say, okay, it has these two V nine parts. How do I take those two V nine parts and arrive at V 11? How did you come up with this formula? Kind of. Yeah. Because, well, it's very rare to be like, I'm trying a V 11 and it's like V zero. And then there's one V 11 move, right? right? Usually it's, you're stacking moves Unless that are the shield. less Yes. <laughs> you're, you're stacking moves that are less difficult than the grade of the boulder problem. Right? right. So at some point those numbers add up to something. Right. Um, but yeah, and it kind of breaks down. Like if you have, I found that if you have, uh, parts that are more than four grades apart, like if you're trying something four grades easier, then it doesn't really add up up to like a certain length of mm -hmm. route, you know, at some point you're just climbing like a route. If you're climbing like 30 moves in a row, it's right. not really, it's hard to relate that to a boulder problem yeah. grade. Wheel of anything. Yeah. Wheel of anything. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, within four grades. So let's say if you climb V five into V nine, you know, if you climb like a 12 move V five, it's still going to be V nine when you get to like the V nine section. But right. if you climb V seven to get to V nine, then it adds up to V 10. Gotcha. That's tricky. It, it, it gets, gets a little tricky, tricky there because, because like there's pump factor, like a 12 move V5 <clears throat> is a lot of moves. And like, I think that that can then influence it, but right by and large, yeah. the rule works. Like your, your the formula works. You guys should at home should think about yeah. your project or whatever. And you should put some numbers and, down on it, paper it and usually works, which is really freaking cool. <laughs> and a, about it and a little lot bit of annoying process. that it can come down to a formula like that. But I think it's, it's super interesting. Did it come from like the, cause it seemed like to me being outside of the bouldering scene at that time, it seemed like it came around the same time as like the sit start craze where everybody was trying to sit start <laughs> everything. Did it, did it coincide with that in your mind at all? Like how do I connect? How do I come up with the grade of how the sit start affects the stand start? I don't think it had to do with that. I mean, I was probably just obsessed with grades in general and just like yeah. breaking things down and trying to get better and like understanding. I, I've personally always been better at longer boulder problems where because mm. I'm like an all around climber, not like one focus style. So if mm -hmm. I can do the longer boulders with, you know, the easier moves and then also like trick my way through them, then I could like conceivably climb harder right. whereas like the the boulders that came down to like one really hard move like i've always like not been able to do that well on so i think it was kind of selfishly trying to understand like which boulders i would excel at if i can understand oh you know i can you know four v7s back to back to back like i can do that oh that's v11 actually you know so when you break it down that way, it's less intimidating if you're, if you're projecting something that's like at yeah, your totally. limit. Mm -hmm. Totally. When you're adding up four boulders like that, four separate V7 sections, mm -hmm. does the formula work the same way? Yeah, exactly. Because two <clears throat> V7s, when you add those up, that's V9. And then okay. two sections of V9, that's yep. V11. So. Gotcha. Yeah. It sounds so simple. <laughs> <laughs> Well, pretty ingenious. I appreciate you guys 
sitting down and frankly i'm glad you got rained out today or snowed out today um hailed out two days in a row now i know i know you're not starts on that but i am so and you know i like i said before eric i appreciate that you're jumping in because you're you're somebody that a lot of the newer boulders are paying attention to i think you know you've you've gone from i mean you've rocketed up in the grades and you are you might be the like single strongest pound for pound person i know is that true <laughs> especially right now <laughs> definitely right now <laughs> yeah i'm no, fat, fat, fat guy power you and but, uh, you and eves gravel he's he's like he's like stronger than me and also so much lighter than me like his his overall strength beats mine yeah yet he's like 30 or 40 pounds lighter than me or something yeah but, i sat uh, down with him in ottawa and did a conversation after he showed me some of his strength feats and yeah. it was kind of ridiculously impressive yeah. i held the lattice world record or whatever for like total weight hung on their edge for five seconds for like maybe like 10 minutes they posted about it and they were like here's our record you can beat it and i was like wait a minute i was training on that edge this summer and i was adding you know 15 pounds to my body weight for five seconds and I hit him up and I was like, this is my number. And they were like, oh my God, congratulations. We have a new Victor. And then like not 10 minutes later, they were like, never mind. Eve's hit us up. He's, he's stronger than you. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, people who are really paying attention to bouldering, who frankly are mostly very white and very privileged are paying attention to what you're doing. So I think it makes a difference that you're speaking out and, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate you both sitting down, taking the time out to get super nerdy. And yeah. I doubt I'll ever have this opportunity to sit down with the, the two nerdiest minds <laughs> of bouldering that I know, but I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us. That was really fun. And I think it's yeah, super important to acknowledge that none of this matters like at all. Yeah. It's like so so stupid. And so stupid. Uh, I don't know. I feel like you know, for anybody out there following the movement in our country right now you know, i could say a lot but just you know ed- educate yourselves humble yourselves you know use this opportunity to grow as people and make a better world so yeah. yeah and if you're listening and you you know you want to get involved somehow we've put a list of resources on our website for educating yourself and for donating and for petitions to sign and all the things you can do sitting right there at your computer at powercompanyclimbing.com slash uprising dash resources and there'll also be a link right there in your show notes so go and do that all right thanks you guys thanks thanks just for a little bit of context uh, concerning those last comments I sat down with Max and Eric shortly after George Floyd was murdered and um, we were in the midst of the the beginnings of this uprising and the protests and Eric was was a loud voice in the Salt Lake climbing community and and I appreciate that he jumped in the way that he did and you know, was taking fire from a lot of the, you know, the the white, super privileged climbers out there who just don't get it, who, who haven't taken the time, frankly, to examine their own privileges. And Eric has and has his priorities in order. And I, I appreciate the fact that he was and still is speaking out um, for for what's right. I also appreciate Eric and Max sitting down so much and having this nerdy conversation. We, there's so many parts of this we didn't get around to, and there has to be a part two at some time. I would love to just sit down with Max sometime and talk to him, so I hope he makes it back to the rock shop as well or is traveling through, or I can drag him out to Oz or some of our amazing boulders out here. Um, or I'll travel down to Salt Lake when it's safe to do so and I'll talk to these guys again. You should go check out Eric's top 100 list. It's the top 100 double digit boulders in the US. Um, Like I said, it's constantly being changed, rearranged. Nearly every one of the top 100 
boulders has a video linked so you'll be able to see all of those videos right there at the link in your show notes in your pocket supercomputer or at powercompanyclimbing.com while you're there check out the crag kit and the boulder bag those will be shipping out very soon so excited that those things will be out in the world finally so many years of working on these You all know where to find us. You can find us on the Facebook, the Instagram, at Power Company Climbing. You should definitely, absolutely, 100% share this top 100 list from Eric Jerome on your Twitters out there. Tweet about it, Twitter about it, whatever it is. I'm not going to see it, though, because we don't tweet. We scream like eagles. This time, 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 this